So, folks, we are live, and uh, with my longtime friend Lee Steinberg here. Lee, great to have you on. On how you doing? Pleasure to be with you. Yeah, definitely, Lee. Uh, the National Football League, as you know, uh, has entered into a, or completed the construction of a, a gigantic deal, media deal, and uh, for the next ten years. And we all know what it'll do for the franchises in terms of value and increase them. But the question is, and I can't think of a better person to ask, how is this going to benefit the players? Uh, and uh, what do you think of the deal overall? Thanks. So if you really think about it, we're in the midst of a pandemic. The economy has cratered. Uh, there were very few fans in the stands of football last year. And in the midst of all of this, they've been able to get a dramatic increase not a decrease, not a cessation, but an increase in rights fees. And it speaks to the dominance that the NFL has on the American imagination now. The networks know they can't recoup all the money they spend for the rights fees in advertising, but they use it as a network building tool so that they get a captive audience on Sundays Sunday night, Monday night, Thursday night. And through that, they show promos for their Monday through Friday shows. And when people see them, their ratings go up for that Monday through Friday block where the big advertising dollars are. And the overall value of the network goes up. So Les Moonves, once when he bought Thursday night football and was head of CBS, came out and said, I just got the right to lose a hundred million dollars on uh, on Thursday night football, but I'm doing it. And so, again, when Fox first got the rights to the NFC, it was a marginal network. It just had shows like Twenty One Jump Street, Ariel's Nine Hundred Three One Zero, and a lot of test patterns. But after it had the chance to air the NFC, it went to the top of the rating chart. And so it's about the bottom line of value of, of network building. And, uh, but still it's an extraordinary achievement in the midst of this economy for people to project far enough into the future to see that it, it's still the best form of programming that uh, money can buy. The future to see um, that it, it's still what do you think of... Um what Jerry Jones had said a few years ago regarding the possible value of the Dallas Cowboys and how does this benefit the players if the Cowboys are going to be worth upwards of $10 billion uh, by 2023, 2024, 2025? How does that help the player? Because there's a split in designated gross revenue as part of the collective bargaining agreement between players and owners, and it's depending on whether they play 17 games, 48% to the players, 52% to the owners. Um, in terms of the revenue and the future of the NFL itself, what does it say uh, about there are people who are actually predicting that the NFL would not survive? I remember as recently as um, a couple of years ago, and obviously that's not the case. The NFL is is with us, and it's quite healthy. Um, what does it say from your, from your standpoint? So if you look at the revenue sources, uh, stadia get more and more sophisticated in becoming sites for multiple revenue streams. So you have new stadia going up all the time in arenas. And what they have is, is luxury boxes for people that have that type of revenue or corporations. They have premium seating um, that offers more amenities. They have naming rights. Um, they have uh, fantasy uh, of football. They have memorabilia. All of it's skyrocketing, and we're exploring 
new ways of enjoying football. So look for virtual reality to take a fan into the actual experience itself. We have new leagues that allow fans to select the owners and coaches uh, themselves. Uh, and we've got all sorts of ways to do it. And we're increasing the number of female fans. 41% of regular season games of viewers were women and as high as 50% uh, for Sunday night football. So we've now got women sitting there who are not just being with their significant others watching a game. They're hardcore football fans too. So it the popularity and appeal continues to spread and there's blue skies in it. What, how is this going to impact stadium development in the future? Because, as you know, the NFL for much of its life relied on public funding. And Commissioner Goodell made a commitment to, wherever possible, of course, the Vegas lit example is an outlier, you know, use private funding. Does this allow the NFL to uh, continue on to that? Or how is that, how is that going to shake out in your view? Well, I think that Private funding is the model for the future. Very few municipalities facing all of the stress they are trying to run budgets, <clears throat> especially in a pandemic time with the ailing economy and tax revenues uh, more difficult to, to find. These stadia will be privately funded. They're great revenue stream creators. The new ones are so state-of-the-art that they have all the bills and whistles that make attending an event easier uh, and more exciting. They focus on fan experience. So you're not as a fan of a certain team going to see endless amounts of victories and no defeats. So the question becomes, what is your experience from the time you get to the parking lot to uh, the time you get back into your home. And so the wise people are carefully programming every part of that and creating more and more revenue opportunities from photo booths to uh, things that, that can be done inside the stadium as well as watch the game. How about on the side of sponsors even in my thought basically is that the nfl got a deal that's great for it but we're still in the middle of a pandemic a number of businesses have taken a hit how long do you think it will take the businesses to come back so that the nfl can realize what commissioner goodell and the ownership had voted on i think a few years ago having that 25 million dollar kind of conic around each nfl city in terms of the objective annual sponsorship or local revenue it was wanted to take in. Because if, my theory is that if they can achieve that, then they'll be back completely whole and then some, you know? I think that some of this depends on factors neither of us can accurately predict, which is how fast the vaccine is effective, whether we reach herd immunity and what stadium attendance will be like next year. It could very well be close to normal. And if that's the case, then you've got amazing television revenue, amazing live gate. You have 40 to 50 million people playing fantasy football. You have the merchandise and memorabilia more popular than ever. You've got, in the future, the whole concept of gambling that will end up being integrated into uh, Stadia. So you have more and more revenue streams. And as for corporations advertising, as I said, the networks understand that for their long-term health, they need to have a loss leader like football. So even if the ad revenue is a little slower to return to pre-pandemic levels, it will still, uh, uh, the teams will still get their uh, share of the national TV contract. Remember, Jenny, when I started back in 1975, each team 
as its share of the national TV contract. And unlike the other sports, they share the main revenue source equally. Um, because the main revenue source for baseball and basketball would be the 162 or 82 games and the local media. Um, and last year it was close to $200 million. So the revenue is so high that uh, the sport's in good shape. Now I always worry that in the future, if you don't have fans playing the game when they grow up, or attending the games live, then the bond won't be sustained. I've always said that if they would just be forward looking and take 10,000 seats out of the mix every week and give them to working families and people with lower incomes, they build the future of uh, the fan base. How about the NFL draft? Because this year the draft is in Cleveland, although I'm not sure how they're going to handle media. I supine it will be something like the super bowl where it was it was virtual um but is that the first test case for whether or not football is returning no i think the ratings will end up being very high for the draft they were high last year but it's a television show it's uh <clears throat> the whole concept of having people gathered in a green room on the stage at madison square garden or anywhere else and coming out one by one when they're selected that's gone away and if you remember like when we went to tennessee they had hundreds of thousands of people out on the street yeah. chicago had a similar thing that's why they rotated it instead of just having it in new york but it's still got all the thrills and this year there's a number of uh, top skill position players that make it glamorous the first four picks could be quarterbacks and they're wide receivers galore so it's uh a razzle-dazzle uh, type draft. And the NFL has become very skilled at building it up as programming uh, in the whole week prior and creating not simply draft night, but a series of uh, nights that runs for three days. And uh, it really is the most exciting time in the life of a player. There's nothing besides going to the Super Bowl that replicates that high. So it's got inherent drama, and draft time is not real time. It's like water torture time while players are waiting. Uh, every second seems like a minute. Every minute seems like an hour. You've got another great set of clients coming up, by the way. And so you're, I know you're quite excited for the draft again. Yes. Um, we have the Pac-12 Defensive Player of the uh, Year, Talanoa Hufanga. We've got a running back from uh, Virginia Tech that led the nation. So it'll be, uh, and we've actually absorbed another firm from Baltimore. Yeah, congratulations. Uh, yeah, talk about that. Yeah, congratulations. Yeah. That's a way of um, expanding our reach, which uh, occurs with Dan Safran and Samantha Sankovich um, and uh, other folks that we're taking in under our umbrella um, to have more reach. And we recently did a deal with uh, Ron Burkle, the UKIPA partners, <coughs> that um, allies us with someone who owns quite a bit. Burkle owns the Pittsburgh Penguins. He owns um, an entertainment agency, a football agency, Soho Clubs, and a number of different, um, a number of different types of, uh, of uh, entities, but it gives us, uh, including a big production company. So it, it's going to help players with um, creating their own content supply and owning it. Um, it's going to make advances in uh, marketing and ultimately be a good uh, fulcrum for expansion. And something, um, as we, you know, out of respect for your time, but um, I think is quite a fascinating development that is related to this increase in franchise value. You have some, and this happened before you had old line owners like the Woonies that at some point are going to have to repurchase 
their shares. And I believe the NFL had to make an adjustment in its rules to accommodate them, I think what was 11 or 12 years ago. Um, do you see that happening again, given the way these franchise values are going? W when does it stop? Well, I think most of the owners, the new, newer owners, are, you know, are buying at this value. So um, where Seattle and Tampa Bay back in 1976 cost $16.5 million dollars, and Carolina and Jacksonville were $130 million. And then there was the bump to Houston in 2000, which was $650 million. You now have virtually all the franchises above a million dollars, and some of them much higher. And uh, this group of newer owners all were successful in another type of business. You mentioned the Rooney's. Who essentially owned the team or Bill Bidwell essentially his major asset was the team and the Mars back in the New York days but the prices are so prohibitive now that you have billionaires buying these teams who were very successful in some other area of the economy and so they bought in at, at these values so those adjustments are not as needed so basically, the NFL is going to be around for another thirty years, you think, or uh, and do you think we'll never see black ownership out of it? I, I'm working on an organization or troop group that's trying to do that. Um, absolutely, absolutely. Um, we've done a very poor job on diversity in the uh, NFL uh, to have as few African American coaches as we do, and as few. Front office personnel, much better, not general managers. But if you look at the diversity in the overall hiring of franchises, it's really good. It's reflective of the communities. But you look at ownership, um, you know, our client Patrick Mahomes just bought into the uh, Kansas City Royals baseball team. I saw LeBron James just bought into the Boston Red Sox. Um, but they'll, they'll be... There is great wealth, income disparity, but great wealth in certain parts of uh, the black community. And, and there certainly is going to be a, a, a African-American or black run uh, franchise uh, in the future. And, uh, you know, it, it, it just makes sense. And we've got to do a better job <clears throat> finding younger coaches they get brought along and become coordinators, so they're poised to become head coaches, you know, in the minority community. And and better training, they at least have the building blocks in place so that we can have more uh, black general managers, team presidents, and all the rest of it. And um, it... it we actually had better numbers on head coaches earlier in our history than we do now. Yeah. And there's no real reason that we shouldn't have much more. Why is it that it seems that we get to a point where it's improvement and yet, and I'm trying to say this in a way that um, is clean, if you will, and yet the, all of a sudden it falls apart. Uh, is it what, what's going oh, on? I, I think that the, I think the Rooney rule has to be active, and just telling people that they have to uh, talk to in, in in hiring a black candidate is not enough. You really need a program earlier to create more black coaches and then more black coordinators, because it's the coordinators off of winning teams that are getting hired now. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, Sean McVay here in Los Angeles at 32. So you have to start in the pipeline much earlier. It reminds me of uh, when I was working with Warren Moon and there was just a few uh, African American quarterbacks. Part of the problem at that time was that a lot of the places blacks were starting a quarterback at the collegiate level was they were playing a spread offense. They were 
smaller athletes who who were tossing the ball off or had great running ability. You needed to have start earlier in high school and college and get six foot four, six foot three, strong armed uh, black African American athletes into that pipeline. So you started having them, and now we've gotten to the point where. Um, African-American quarterbacks are really dominating the league in many ways. I mean, the last Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson, Deshaun Watson, I mean, it's uh, are, yeah. are playing at the highest level, winning Super Bowls, um, and, and, and even more important, there are African-American backup quarterbacks. Right, right. So that, that you don't have to be the greatest superstar in the world to still be considered, you know, as as a possible backup or replacement. So, but it but it, what it needed was a whole lot of development at the high school and younger level to create enough pressure with uh, these talented athletes playing in pro sets or at least spread offenses that they'd make it. I'm curious, though, because something I thought about 15 years ago when I first realized in the California parlance that by 2040, we would have a majority minority state in California. I thought, you know, we're going to get to a point where a white counterpart will believe that the resources are not there for them and they will protest. I had that idea 15 years ago. And, you know, today you know, we have seeds of that all over the place. And I'm concerned, Lee, that we seem to make these pockets of progress in terms of true integration with friends and everything. I grew up with a great interracial fan base or a friend base. I mean, <laughs> but it pains me that now I feel like we're being torn asunder primarily for economic reasons, because from April till now we've had more jobless ben uh, assignments or claims than any time in our history, say for the depression. And, um, what do we do to get the integration right? Because I don't want to see a, a country where you have my, you know, white friends here, Asian friends here, and we're not talking to each other, and it becomes, you know, a zero-sum game all the time, and no one enjoys the United States anymore. So I grew up very much in the same uh, atmosphere as you. There was a federal aid housing project across the street from my elementary school, so the world always looked like blacks and Latinos and Asians. Uh, to me, because it's all I really ever knew. One of the problems today is that the information sources that people are using to define reality are so different. So you have one group over here who's watching CNN and MSBC and reading daily newspapers, another group that's watching Fox, <clears throat> reading Breitbart, AON, and getting the news from different sources. So these two visions of reality are um, uh, go going away from each other. And um, uh, so theories that one group thinks are absolutely absurd, fanciful, and made up, another group uh, devoutly believes. And so that's a problem because the expansion of television and the expansion of media have given certain people the ability to simply reinforce their point of view without considering others, right? Yes. And so um, where I think that QAnon is, is uh, crazy, um, other people fervently believe that. And um, the key to, to listening is to have, uh, to the whole thing is to have a shared vision that we're all Americans. We are all Americans, you know, and it shouldn't take a war or someone invading to remind us of all the commonality we have. And instead, uh, people have been uh, infused with this passion uh, and, you know, sense of victimization uh, that uh, everybody can't be a victim, you know. It's it's a pretty good country in <laughs> all sorts of ways. <laughs> Never perfect, always improving, um, uh, with a history that you can read clearly so you understand what the flaws are. But, oh, my God, would you trade um, uh, and go live in Russia or China or, or in a, a poverty-stricken uh, country? So... I think that's the problem, and athletes can be part of the solution because to the degree that 
as you know, our practice is about role modeling. And to the degree it's, it's about triggering imitative behavior, which is inclusion and tolerance and the rest of it. It's great. And sports are also something that can take people from a variety of political backgrounds, a variety of ethnic, racial, religious backgrounds, and put them all together, you know, to root for the Rams or the Dodgers or the Lakers here. And we've got commonalities. So, but there's been no, uh, very little emphasis on how much we share in common and everything is about the issues that uh, divide us. Um, I don't choose my friends on, uh, uh, on, uh, on the basis of their political views. Do you know who created QAnon, by the way? The Trump administration 2016 campaign. I got that from Rick Gates. I had him on as a guest three times. Um, it's something else we've done. Hey, um, before we close, any thoughts on what Deshaun Watson is uh, experiencing? So, uh, the, the problem is <clears throat> that if an athlete experiences um, some accusation <clears throat> about their conduct, if they don't have a good damage control strategy, um, which includes getting your arms around all the facts, finding out what's actually true and what's not. And then if it's behavior that um, an athlete feels is not representative of him, coming out very quickly with an apology and with the added feature that they're going to take steps to remediate the behavior. So someone who's drunk driving will go to anger. <clears throat> someone getting in a fight will uh, go to anger men. <clears throat> someone with uh, domestic abuse will uh, go to anger management plus go to sensitivity training. <clears throat> <clears throat> but if you allow the um, this repetitive news cycle to keep recycling and republishing it, people will believe <clears throat> because they've seen it multiple times. People will believe <clears throat> that um, something is true. So I don't know, <clears throat> we don't know what's true or not in a accusation of uh, either domestic violence or harassment. It's always he said, she said. <clears throat> but but if you have vulnerability as an athlete, you best be out front, accept your responsibility, and try to get the healing going again. Um, and uh, and if you're actually innocent, <clears throat> in some ways, you better get out and say that too. Watson's attorney said today that at least one of the filings is false, and he believes that the other ones are false. And I have to candidly say, Lee, I've really studied this from a guy who was that close to law school myself and shepherdized cases. Um, I would be very surprised if I were aggressive as a lawyer. I would try to get Tony Busby disbarred. That's how bad it looks. You mean the lawyer who filed suit? Yes, sir. Yeah, it's that bad. Um, <clears throat> so, if you're trying to preserve watching his reputation then <clears throat> and you know or believe this to be false get out there quickly and and get your face on a uh, television and tell your story because otherwise <clears throat> what happens is people don't read the paper or watch very closely at times you've done a lot more research into this than just the average person the average person is just going to associate the name with the accusation. So <clears throat> you got to get out quickly and don't speak before an athlete in crisis knows the facts. But if, the <clears throat> if you believe the facts to be different than the accusation, get out there and, and tell the world. Sound advice from Lee Steinberg. Hey, uh, great to see you, my friend, and continued success. Uh, hey, stick around in the background because uh, I just want to um, 
uh, share some some good news with you. Hey, everybody! Thanks for tuning in, and uh, we're gonna. This is live, but we're also gonna take out those parts that uh, we went kind of left, and uh, this is gonna be nice and clean within moments. Uh, subscribe to Zinni sixty two, and tomorrow we have the Oakland Chief of Police, Lerone Armstrong, is our guest at one o'clock Pacific, four o'clock on the East. I mean, we're quite excited. Lee, stick around. Thanks a lot, and go Bears. <laughs> go Bears.